Hi, how you doing? Hi, good morning, good afternoon. Exactly, good morning, afternoon, and hi everybody. I know some of you are coming in at midnight, so welcome. Um, let's <laughs> let everybody come on in for a second, but in the meantime, this is of course Sarah Duncan, who is awesome and a jewelry historian, a gemologist, an auctioneer, has a fabulous background, and most importantly for us today, tons of cool pieces to show. So, um, ah, and Richard just said my two favorites. Ah. Uh, you had us at hello. Exactly. Uh, all right, so hi everybody, <laughs> come on in. Hi Marjorie, welcome. All right, so um, today, you know, what I really want us to do today with Sarah is to show you that there's lots and lots of reasons to keep auction houses on your radar, whether or not you are a dealer. And one of the major reasons that I look for personally is that a jewelry historian and a really good one is in charge of the jewelry department at an auction house. What does that mean? You know, how do pieces, pieces come to auction. Somebody might inherit. I mean, if you've seen Antique Roadshow, they might say they might not even know what they had. And so if there's a jewelry historian in charge, that piece will go wherever it's closest usually. And Sarah, you're going to go way more into this. But if there's a historian there, they're going to find the amazing pieces that somebody else will miss. And that means as the consumer, you can go into an auction house and get in incredibly lucky. You also can find pieces that belong in a museum that you wouldn't see anywhere else. And if you're just looking for gifts or collecting for yourself, you can get the best maison in the world because that historian knew what they were looking at. So welcome, Sarah. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you so much. I'm so glad I paid you millions of dollars to say all those nice things about me. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty cheap date. I'll, you know, I'll fall for a good piece of Cartier. <laughs> So um, let's just jump in. Before we get into the awesome pieces that you're showing, I would love to talk a little bit about your background. So can you just tell us a little bit about your family relationship to jewelry? Are you from a jewelry family? How did you get into this? So I'm not from a jewelry family. My mom, who might be watching, probably forgot, overslept, um, <laughs> uh, thinks it's hilarious that this is what I do for a living. Um, I did spend a lot of my childhood making jewelry the same way we all did like necklaces and fun little things like that but my family background is actually much more in the antiques world mm -hmm. so both of my grandmothers were avid antique uh, collectors and my one of my grandmothers actually had an antique shop oh, cool. um, so yeah so there was always this appreciation for older things around me my dad is a um a very uh, skilled artisan wood wood maker uh, woodworker sorry um, so he could make beautiful things and he knew how things were made my mother in a good way has the most critical eye you've ever seen but in a good way you know when you go out and you're trying you know you're going shopping and she will find whether or not one thread hasn't lined up perfectly so I think that's the sort of background that's it's contributed perfect to the way my brain works. <laughs> so what did you study in school? So I have three degrees in the most useless thing imaginable, which is classics and archaeology. Oh, um, so cool, so cool, fabulous. I was a dig director in Tuscany and oh. I really loved it. But ultimately there's a very limited market out there for archaeologists, um, particularly ones who like shiny things. <laughs> so how do you end up, 10 years ago, you were at Bonhams, and how do you go from classics and studying to, oh, Helen is asking where you studied the classics, so maybe we should do that too. Um, my postgraduate degree is from St. Andrews, actually, in Scotland. Oh, I think you might have won up Talon. <laughs> um, we're, we're going, by the way, for the Sarah's answers when she's been drinking heavily today. So we're going to try not to be too tame. Um, Just to be clear, I've not been drinking on the job. <laughs> I, I also believe this, but Helen... We're throwing down with you just to see if you can throw up some good answers. So, um, you, okay, so you're at St. Andrews. Oh, Helen went to Oxford. Okay, you're both posh, fine. A plus. It's time time. So, <laughs> so 
So you are at St. Andrews. How do you end up at Bonhams? And then from Bonhams, why do you choose Chiswick? If you don't know, by the way, about 20 minutes away from Heathrow, you're in the London area. Yeah, so we're less, we're less West London. Yeah. Um, so I always say jewelry chose me. Um, I left St. Andrews, this was about at the end of the noughties, um, we all know the economic realities were a little bit, um, a little bit tough at the time. Um, and I had friends who worked at Bonhams. I was applying for every job under the sun, and I um, I applied for three or four jobs at Bonhams. And the one I got the interview for was the administrator at the jewelry department. And I didn't know much about jewelry. I hadn't any gemological background or anything like that, but uh, I got the job and I worked my way up from there. So jewelry chose me and I had a wonderful team at Bonhams. I started in the Knightsbridge Gallery and then ultimately ended up in the Bond Street Gallery and so supportive. So, um, the, you know, all of my colleagues at Bonhams were so wonderful in, in nurturing and teaching. And I just really, really can't thank them enough for everything I learned there. At what point in your Bonhams career did you decide to get the GG and why, what compelled you? So I started my GG, yeah, at Bonhams. Um, I did it through the London campus. So as most people tend to do it, um, not on campus, but distance learning. So I did it that way. Um, and it was a great way to do it. I, I wanted to do the GG because uh, being an American, I just felt it was um, the right platform for me. Um, a little bit more commercial, which is uh, part of the um, part of the, the part that I liked, I guess. It's, it's why I was working in the industry was the commercial side of it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. All right, so you also have become an auctioneer, which not everybody does. So we've talked a lot about, you know, you might want to stay on the inside of an auction house without ever putting yourself on the podium. So why auctioneering and what was your path to it? Did they have a training program? How did it work? Yeah, so I was trained at Chiswick Auctions, actually. We had a, um, a, a team of us, a little squad of us who were trained up at the same time and I just I really enjoyed it I think you have to be a bit of an extrovert um, to do auctioneering you have to have a little bit of um, terrible barroom chat you know just awful barroom chat <laughs> because you are sort of up there conducting um, yeah. you know a, a, an orchestra in a way um, so yeah, I was really lucky to get trained up here and I really enjoy it actually. It's a really interesting way of monitoring what's going on um, and seeing all the interest levels and everything that's happening in the room. So we're gonna go deep on your auctioneering on how things have changed obviously since the pandemic, but I know everybody is here to see cool pieces. So um, if you've just joined us, welcome, put your questions in the question box. I will turn comments off so you can get a better view of the pieces, but I know you have an auction coming up on the 28th, and what I thought we should do is let's take some key pieces from that auction and talk about the cool part of your job, which is how do you authenticate them? How did they come in? How do you receive them? What are their mysteries? And then if you can also talk a little bit about what purpose they serve, because I think that's also really cool. Like if you're a collector, if you're just purchasing for Self or for a gift if you're a dealer you know did you find something different and special so we'll just jump in again put your questions in the question box and I'm going to turn comments off so that Sarah can jump in with the first one perfect oh. so where should we start um you pick I'm I'm excited mm -hmm. to see what you think though because I know you've got really cool stories on these and you know that's my <laughs> well okay so I suppose if we want to start I watched your fabulous Insta Live with Robert Lee Morris. Uh -huh. um, the great. He's so great. And I have to say, he's not a jeweler who comes up very often. Right. Um, so I thought I would just show you one of the pieces that we have from oh, him. Cool. Oh, that's awesome. <gasps> so, ooh. It's mesmerizing, isn't and it? And just reminding you, by the way, everybody, if you're an American buying a piece that was made in the U.S., wherever it is, you're not going to pay customs and duty. As long as it was made in the U.S., no charge for you. You're out, which is terrific. So this was um, this was made, uh, and, and Robert was so nice. He, he immediately 
popped up and said, I remember making that piece, oh, fuck. Um, <laughs> which is great. Yeah. He said it was made for an exhibition in Europe. He couldn't remember which one, but okay. they're all hand, um, hand beaten, handmade links, these little square links. And uh, it was all made in 18 karat gold. It was what he's telling me. Uh, it's stamped 18 karat 18K, so all that makes sense. And his fine jewelry isn't as prevalent on the market, I suppose. His his costume jewelry, is, his art-led jewelry, whatever form it is, mm -hmm. um, is, is mainly made out of, um, he was saying brass and silver is what he loves, exactly. So to find one in gold is, is, a, rare, is a rare treat. Okay, so this one, if you don't mind sticking it on your wrist just so we can see what it looks like. Now, Robert Lee is alive, so presumably you could actually, oh, I love that. You could call, for those of you uh, watching, you can bid on this. What's the lot number for Robert This Lee? is lot number 26. Lot 26. And um, so he's alive. You could presumably call him up and ask questions. But what if you can't? So to what extent do you, did you know the donor, the, or sorry, the consigner for this? Like, does it just, how did it come to Chiswick? How did it come to you? So this was consigned by um, a lovely client of mine who's a regular. She's okay. a huge jewelry buyer. She was really funny. She forgot who it was by. Sorry, don't tell Robert. <laughs> she, <laughs> the work for itself, we need. She, she has so much, you know. <laughs> well, and how common is that? So you, Sarah, personally have a relationship to lots of people and presumably lots of people with, let's call it a little bit of a collecting addiction. So how common is it that, you know, periodically they'll call you and say, I'm ready to put these pieces up? Quite often, actually. And I think people, people are sort of slowly getting the idea of auctions more and more private clients are slowly getting the idea i mean traditionally the auction business has been run on this is a bit crass but the three d's so yeah. death divorce and debt um but more and more people are realizing that jewelry is something that you can buy you can enjoy for a while and you can sell it it always has an intrinsic value and if you buy smart to begin with you can find a way to, you know, almost trade in your pieces, as it were, you know, you can, you, you make a little money, you lose a little money. And at the end of the day, you've had a beautiful jewel that you've been able to enjoy for years. And when you're not enjoying it anymore, the auction business is the right method. Which is, by the way, the only verifiable way sustainable, right? You're recirculating existing works in the economy. Exactly. you able to these luxury with a little bit less damage to the planet. Um, Some so of these pieces have a carbon footprint of about five feet. <laughs> look, and we'll and we'll get to that too. Will you hold it up one more time, please? So while we're talking about Robert Lee, just to close this one out, you mentioned up front that not a lot of his fine jewelry pieces come up for auction. So no. responsible for estimate for a pre-sale estimate. So what do you do when there aren't that many comps? Like obviously you can start from the penny weight of the gold. Right. But what do you do? So you're going to have to start looking for comparables. You know, you're looking at what other fashion jewelry trend um, designers are, are appearing on the market. What's their premium? Um, you know, are you seeing are you seeing high demand for these pieces, or is it something that um, the market's gone soft on? There's always actually the design element to them as well, which I think is really important for jewelry. Because even if it's not someone that you've ever heard of, like mm -hmm. for instance, this ring. Oh yeah, the Malachite. I'll turn off comments again, and we could just jump into that one. So those of you who've just joined us, welcome. Please put your questions in the question box because I'm going to keep commenting off so you can better see the pieces. All right, so tell us what we're looking at. And if you don't mind holding it up a little, yeah. great. I'm just going to take this tag up so you can see it properly. So oh. this is um, a Malachite dress ring. Ooh. It's little individual components. I'll flip the camera around, actually. That might be a bit better. Okay. Um, well, how do I do that? Uh, I'll just hold it here. That looks like two different arrows. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is all different malachite segments formed together, and it just makes a fabulous ring. There's oh, no maker. Cool. There's no heritage. 
it's just cool. Yeah, it looks a lot like the 70s lapis one that just came up at Christie's, right? Like the Cartier lapis with the gold in between. Exactly. So if you're looking at that piece then, where did that come from? So did it, is it another repeat client? Like how did it show up to you? Is it? Yeah, it's another repeat client. So again, a client who, who loves buying really fun artist-led jewelry, not necessarily by designers, but people who just really appreciate the aesthetic for the jewelry. And you, as you know, as much as I do, when you're buying a name, you're buying a premium, you know, there's a, there's, and if you're not concerned about the name, which some people aren't, then they can just buy really funky, very awesome. unusual pieces and enjoy them. Um, and so in that case, does the client remember much about the piece? And when they don't, how do you start? So you're not authenticating as much other than the materials, right? Because it's known to have no name. Yeah. But what about then setting a pre-auction estimate? How do you do it when it has no maison? So if there's no maison, you're looking at, again, you're looking at sort of comparables. So like the Christie's one, obviously, is a much yeah. more sculptural, fine example. And you have to sort of adjust from there. So are we looking at a high diamond content? Are we looking at a high gold content? And you're finding the balance of what similar pieces are, are performing on the market for. We're quite lucky here that we try and offer quite a, um, an accessible price point for our auctions. So the majority of what we sell ranges from about the 500 to the 5,000 pound mark. So pieces like this, not by a particular designer, are things we handle very frequently. So you can establish a track record um, of, of where your premiums are and what clients are, are, are trending towards. So Richa is asking how you come up with an estimate for the Malachite for the artistry. So you have, for example, like this is just sort of an estimate of value of Malachite. It's nice Malachite. It's nicely matched. But what about this is beautifully carved? How do you capture that in your estimate? Yeah, so workmanship's really important. Condition is another thing that's really important when you're dealing with vintage jewelry. Um, I think we always kind of, we always kind of have to bear in mind that jewelry is not infallible. It can get chipped, it can get scratched. And especially when you're buying secondhand, always look for good condition reports, ask for extra images, all of that sort of thing. So this one is in for an auction estimate of four to 600 pounds. I mean, can you imagine? Like you couldn't make that. <laughs> What's the number on that one? This is lot number 56. Okay, so if you're following at home, lot 56. Lot 56. Let's do it. So if you want to talk about designer jewelry. Um... I, do. I do, because a big point that I want to make is that, again, you don't have to be a dealer. You don't have to be making a big collection. It could just be that you're looking for a cool piece to wear for yourself or for a present. And it's always easy to find a great house. And everybody's going to recognize the name and be excited. And you can get really lucky with an auction. So let's do a couple in. Okay. So if we're going to dive into the elements of um, fashion meets jewelry, okay. in the UK, you can't really start talking about that without talking about Sean. Comments off. Everybody put your questions in the question box. <laughs> Love that. Oh, Isn't that's this so cool? chic. So again, if you don't know the name, um, collaborated with, uh, with Alexander McQueen. Uh, Alexander McQueen, also did runway collaborations with Zach Posen, who's joining us online. Um, fabulous, fabulous design. Oh, great collaboration with Boucheron. Terrific. Really impressive. Really impressive. How did it, like, this is to me a perfect example of a piece that a non-jewelry historian would miss. This comes in, they look at it and say, I don't know what that is. This is not valuable. But if you know anything about fashion and history, this becomes a lot more exciting. In addition, it's just beautiful. So what is this piece? What's it made out of? If it weren't the designer, how would you value it versus the designer? So if it wasn't by a designer, it wouldn't be here. The intrinsic value is pretty negligible, to be really honest with you. This isn't turquoise, it's a resin. Mm -hmm. This isn't gold, it's silver gilt. Mm -hmm. It is literally cool, and that's it. 
And, you know, I, I know that Melanie Grant says this a lot in Coveted, right? Art, jewelry as art is not just the sum of the intrinsic value of the parts. And I think this is a very good example, right? It's hard not to think of this as a gorgeous sculpture. You have a question. Um, so the material uh, is resin. And what did you say the tip was? It's silver gilt. Silver gout. So again, if you were to buy this, first you couldn't because a lot of his pieces are for runway and they're kind of one-offs. But let's say you could, it would be nothing related to the pre-sale estimate, which is what? So this is a pre-sale auction estimate of 100 to 150 pounds. Oh man. This is his tusk range. He does do these, you know, they are in his website. It is, a, it is a line that he launched years ago. This is from 2012, this one. In terms of funny stories, yeah. so I have a great client. This is the funny thing about the pandemic is that I've developed really wonderful relationships with people that I've never met. <laughs> you and I have never met, which is shocking because we like text each other. Gab online. Exactly. Um, but I have a great client who um, sends me packages of jewelry every once in a while. She's clearing out uh, her mother, her grandmother's uh, jewelry. And she sent me a picture of just a whole bunch of turquoise jewelry, sort of thing you buy in Mexico on holiday. Uh -huh. And I said to her, I said, look, you know, it's a great look, but realistically, there's not a lot of value there. She says, well, I don't want it. I said, we'll send it in. We'll see what we can do. And lo and behold, the package arrives, and at the bottom of it, amongst all these, you know, turquoise matrix beads and big heavy silver things, sniffing around, and there's no. this. Oh, and she didn't know that it she was more or less than her other stuff. Love. No idea. And, I mean, it's got Strongly's Maker's Mark, it's clear as day, it's an instantly recognizable piece from his collection. But it wasn't in the picture she showed me. And if I hadn't said, send it in, It'd probably be in a charity shop right now. Wow. Oh, that's so cool. Remind us the lot number again on this. This one's lot 29. Lot 29. Now, um, if you'll put Robert Lee's bracelet up again for one more second, he has been kind enough to say, did you know that my 18K squares bracelet can be worn up or down, concave or convex? The concave side up is my fave as the light bounces up in more dramatic ways. Thank you for this, Sarah. Neat. No, it's Oh, that's so cool. And one of the things I love about Instagram Live is that you can actually have artists talk with each other and with us, which is just so much fun. He's so, so generous, isn't he? He's so generous and giving. The best. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so I suppose we should probably talk about actual um, antique jewelry. Okay. If that works. Yeah. Um, so this is, oh, I love that. Oh, look at that pen. So tell us what this is and how it showed up. So this is from a really lovely client, a European client of mine. And this is, this is Art Nouveau, as you can all see real Art Nouveau, but Spanish Art Nouveau. So Fort. this is by Macera y Carrera. Mm -hmm. It dates to about 19, uh, 1915 to 1920. This is called Picajou Enamel. And you can see through it like a, um, <sighs> like, like a stained glass window almost. And the thing about these pieces is they they get damaged so easily. And this one is in fantastic condition. Wow. <laughs> I've been really protective of it. Really protective. Uh, <laughs> you, you just got a, oh my God, this brooch. Totally agree with you. Oh my God. Isn't it just so sensual? So do you, do you know this client? Do you know if they ever wore this piece? Like how is it in such good condition? Because enamel chips if you sneeze <laughs> she did wear it it was a gift from her husband wow. um, she did wear it she hasn't worn it for a while so that's why it's come to the auction platform so that she can try okay. and put the funds towards something else um but yeah it, it did have a life it did go out 
I don't think she, uh, you know, played a lot of rugby with it or anything, but it definitely had a few glamorous dinner parties and opera occasions. Oh, I'm just going to turn it over Please. so you can see the back of it. Let me try and turn my diamond light on, actually, so you get a little... Can you see the luminosity? That's the light through the, the enamel is fab. Wow. It's just beautiful. That is gorgeous. All right, so... How do you go about estimating? So this is a house that maybe isn't as well known locally, but to a collector means a lot. It has a particular time period. How do you build up an estimate for it? And how do you research it when it's not as accessible, say, as a Van Cleef and Arpels to just call up the archivist? Yeah, so I think the nice thing about the age that we live in is that Google is really our friend. <laughs> honest it's so true <laughs> i mean if you're looking at buying any piece of jewelry whether uh -huh. you know you're buying it at an auction whether you're buying it at sotheby's whether you're buying it at an auction house you've never heard of or from a dealer the best thing you can do is to do your research and thankfully almost every auction house will list its results uh -huh. um, so you can go on major auction houses websites and you can go through and see what similar pieces have sold for uh -huh. um, Christie's is the only one that doesn't list unsolds they only list solds so that does slightly skew it I would but <laughs> But you do have the option of seeing what things were presented at, what they've sold for, and you can kind of get a gauge on where the competitive bidding is. With a piece like this, Macera y Carrera, very, very old Spanish firm. I think they were originally established in the late 1700s, um, the Macera side of it was. They merged with the Carrera side. Um, in the early 1900s. And they had this hugely prolific period of just the most beautiful Barcelona Art Nouveau pieces. If anyone's been to Barcelona, that city does Art Nouveau like no one's business. They're so fabulous. Um, so having a look at what similar pieces have sold for, bearing in mind the condition, bearing in mind the styling of it. This is wonderful because it's so invocative of every sort of Art Nouveau tick box. Is it a, is it a beautiful, delicate, feminine form? Tick. Is it foliate? Yes, tick. So it has all those um, iconic uh, symbols associated with, which is really nice. Absolutely. And um, Francesca Grima just joined and I want a sidebar on this because you also are very active as a jewelry historian reviewing works and writing articles. So just to give everybody some context, how do these things take place in time? You just had an article come out on Grima, you are a review. You also were evaluating pieces at the same time. So with your auction coming up on the 28th, when did you write and and how are you taking these pieces in? How far in advance? So some of these pieces have been in my safes for six months now, sometimes longer. Yeah. Um, the auction process is not a get, get cash quick process. Uh, and to be honest, if an auction house says I'll sell that for you next week, I would be very concerned personally. Because... It's just not fair on you um, as a vendor to have your piece not get the due diligence it deserves. Um, real research takes a long time. And how common is it to have the mix of historic and modern pieces? So, for example, in preparing for this sale, are you intentionally dividing up X amount will be historic, X amount will be modern, or does it just depend sort of what's come up? I personally love a mix. Mm -hmm. I think a mix is really important because at the end of the day, even if you're a huge antique jewelry lover, you probably will find yourself really leaning towards some modern pieces as well. So I do like to put a real balance into our auctions because I think old and new blend really beautifully together. So I'll just show you what I'm wearing if that's okay. Oh, yeah. I'll turn off comments. Feel free to put your questions on the question box, viewers. So I don't normally do this, guys but I am wearing a piece from the sale. Oh, that's so pretty. This is lot 48. I don't know if you can see it okay. Should I turn my light on? Try it back. Mm -hmm. No. 
sorry. It's very dark in London. Hold it. It's actually weirdly dark here today, too. Um, so this is a 19th century Citrine Riviera. And I'm wearing a pair of Pomelado Citrine earrings, which are 20 years old or something. And I think they look lovely together. You can tell me. You know, no, I maybe maybe and not. I tell it to your face. <laughs> uh, Sarah, that doesn't work. <laughs> oh, so that's... this. Oh, pretty. This is a really classic piece. Mm -hmm. Every jewelry historian will have seen something like this. Yeah. They came into popularity in about the 1840s and they never really left for the rest of the century. So it does make dating a little difficult because it was such a prevalent theme. The galleries, the surroundings can give us a really good idea of the date, but to be safe, you know, we're saying second half of the 19th century. Okay. This one, I fished out of a pile of costume jewelry. Stop and realized it was real. Again, go with the jewelry historian in charge of a department because they're going to find the finds. So this one has no name also. Do you have an intentional mix of maison and no name? Don't get me wrong. If you have anyone listening, a hundred lots of Art Deco Cartier jewelry, please do call me and I will dedicate an entire sale to you. <laughs> But in reality, we all have a mix in our own jewelry boxes. We all have things that don't have names and we all have things, if we're lucky enough, that do have names. So there's no reason why we should always have a sale just dedicated to one maker. Um, because, it, and I think it, it's, it's important for us to be able to celebrate the artistry that isn't always dependent upon a name because there's up and coming designers, there's people who are making very cool things that might not have that you know, that, that, that cachet, that following. And I don't think it's appropriate to just say, no, we only sell signed jewelry here because I personally think it's, it's an important value factor, but it's not the end all be all. So um, at some of the auctions that are coming up, um, there are from one collector. So for the viewers, would you mind talking a little bit about as the head of the department, what is your expected premium or increase interest or value if a whole lot of pieces come in together from one collector? What difference does it make if you have one piece from Jar, say, or 25 from a California collector? Yeah, I think having the panache of a bigger size collection, even if it's only five lots, it doesn't have to be a dozen lots. It doesn't have to be 30 lots. Even if it's a small collection, can really show um, show the pieces off in their best light. And it also gets a lot more interest. So I don't have one here in front of me, I'm afraid, but we do have a special collection from a private collector of a British jeweler called Wendy Ramshaw. Mm -hmm. So she's, it's a, it was a personal friend of Wendy Ramshaw who sadly just died. Um, this is lots one to six on our website if you wanted to check them out. Um, and she, uh, she was, you know, she was an avid collector. She loved her piece. She commissioned things. She still has loads more. Wow. Um, <laughs> but she's decided it was time to sell. And I really did say to her, look, if you want to make a splash, try putting as many as you feel comfortable in the auction. And it's paid off. I had a client come in yesterday with five or six pieces of Wendy Ramshaw and said, my mother did the same thing. And so now we're talking about putting those into an next sale because I've already got lots of interest. Bids are coming through enough of it to get the serious collectors interested. Sure. Um, we are getting repeated requests for lots and to compare it to the Robert Lee Moore bracelet. I know you did not prepare that. So do you Which have one? A lot six, one of the Wendy pieces? Yeah. No, I don't have lot six. Um, all right, so let's move on to another wild and crazy piece. I might be able to get lot six though, hold on. Yeah, if you wanna. Let's see if email works. Watching box, I will um, turn off the comments every time we put up a piece. We are building up to the wild and crazy story of the Cartier work, so it is coming. Um, how <laughs> And let's call it an everyday, I would like to give a gift piece. So I know you get 
Hermes, for example, all the time. And I'm always telling people, if you've gone into Hermes and you had a panic attack at the pricing, just relax and go to an auction house and you can get your holiday gifts. Trust. So um, can you show us something, say, from Hermes? Do you play cards? I do. And I cheat. I totally cheat. All right. <laughs> so for the... Lady Ooh. poker player out there, may I suggest an Hermes charm bracelet? I love. Oh, that's Isn't this great. And let's let's remind everybody how good this gets. What is your pre-sale estimate? Oh, uh, well, what do you think it is? I mean, I know that Hermes would. I'm gonna I'm gonna say something graphic, so I'm not gonna do it. It would be much much more. <laughs> So this has a pre-auction estimate of 2,200 to 2,800. I mean, like that, you just, you're not going to find it. First of all, what, what's your estimate of the age of this piece? 90s? You know, I haven't given it a date in our cataloging, but I would say it's got at least 20 years, if not more on it. I'd say it's somewhere between, let's say the 80s to be safe. Um, mm -hmm. I think somewhere in that age. Um, I haven't printed anything, but my gut instinct is it's got 20 to 30 years worth of age on it, at least. Arm bracelets are back. Like there's something just so cool and funky about them. You're getting a, this bracelet is so fast colleagues at Elmwood's as well. <laughs> it's a great piece. It's, it's got all the heritage you could ever want. I mean, yeah. if you're talking about quality and workmanship, I wish I could show you how heavy this is. It is a substantial piece. It just feels so tactile when you're wearing it. And you can loop it around and you could even add it to a Wendy Ramshaw piece. Ooh, look at that. And plus you get the cred of saying, you know, darling, I got you an Hermes bracelet. Or let's be honest, I got me an Hermes bracelet. <laughs> Hermes made some beautiful jewelry. And I think it's really interesting how the big fashion houses have started really embracing jewelry since the 90s. Um, I think it's really interesting to see where our trends in jewelry are shifting towards because it wasn't always the case. They were very, very well divided lines. But now, I mean, look, how many fashion jewelers have we talked about already, you know? And, and the, the quality, the style, it's, it's there. It really is. I mean, I know Chanel, for instance, all of their fine jewelry is made in Paris, mm -hmm. it, you know, or very close to Paris, you know, but it's all made in France. I mean, you can't, you can't say that of Tiffany. You can't say that of Cartier, you know. It's amazing that these fashion houses are really honoring the jewelry heritage, as it were. And actually, I'm going to ask Katrine Cariou, who is watching, can you comment, please, if you are aware of the fashion houses using some of the workshops may have overlapped with the Grand Maison? Because they do. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. Clear within the house also when it's happening. Because it's just, it's an interesting question, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they do, actually. So many wonderful working jewelers out there who um, their pieces get get picked up by various uh various um big houses i have one here actually Ooh, funny. Let's do it cool i will turn transition off. there <laughs> no i liked it i thought it was smooth i did so these oh. are cufflinks please please don't let me be alone with noticing what these look like <laughs> hold them up to the camera you? i don't know what you're talking about they're just your average everyday cufflinks ah. For the man who has everything, give him two more. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> um, <laughs> Who is the designer? Let me do this. That might make more sense. <laughs> oh, I mean, I know I'm not alone with those people. I think the comments need to come on for this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> who is the designer? Will you remind us, please? So these are Shomei. <laughs> Now I want to make from the tiara to the bedroom jokes. This is no good. I'm from top to bottom. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll make cufflinks. Absolutely chic. Marjorie's just said we have dirty minds. But Marjorie, you see it, don't you? I know you see it. Thank you, Nick. I just got the comment of the century. 
But I, hello, I'm not alone. I would <laughs> like those unironically just to have people react, just to see if they would. Because you know, like, who can sit next to me if you take one look and your eyes go big and you start laughing. <laughs> I have to say. Oh, that Tom's bottom. <laughs> That's so good. Oh, just <laughs> coming with the auction houses. I'm not sure you did. All right. So, what other Insta Live are you going to get this on? <laughs> so, this special number comes in. Who, who exactly? <laughs> who can sign these? <laughs> Clearly, someone who has everything. Oh, so good. <laughs> I have to say, if you do want to giggle, um, and I, I love my photography team here, please, please don't ever tell them I said this, but they really didn't think very hard about how they shot these. So if you'd like a giggle, please go on our website and check out Lot 139. Lot 39, run to 139. Wow, that is so great and exactly the mood booster I needed. And let's be honest, during COVID, I think we all might need that mood booster. What's going to make you happier than putting on your show make cufflinks and thinking? Oh, I can't. I can't. Can you imagine holding up your wrist and going? <laughs> so in the boardroom today, guys. Oh, boy. I know. <laughs> but when we're talking about, um, you know, small jewelers mm. working for the big auction, oh, sorry, for the big maisons, mm -hmm. um, this is a great example. So these were made by a London jeweler called Kirk Weiss. Oh. most people probably haven't have never heard of um the reason i know his mic incredibly well is because it looks a lot like the kaczynski makers mark oh interesting again go with the jewelry historian someone else might have missed this cool i've seen it many times actually where things are cataloged as kaczynski or sold as kaczynski but it's kirk weiss because if you take wow. a quick look they look really, really similar. Um, so so I know his mark well. <laughs> sure that your mark is distinctive because in the future, somebody might attribute it to the wrong person. So true. So true. So yeah, so Kirk Weiss was making jewelry for lots of different people, but these were Shomei. So Shomei was, was their sign, Shomei. Um, let me see if I can actually get the camera to, to perform for me. I don't know if that will work. Um... Ish. No, no, no really. Collection, but we do have some lovely people from Shome on the uh, live today. Hello. So you can throw comments in the uh, question box also. Love. I really so, want them. <laughs> I what do you think? Do we think ladies wearing cufflinks is a great idea? I, I wear cufflinks. I love them. I love a French cuff. I think especially if you're on Zoom, you're a hand talker like I am, it adds a little fun. Right, dress up for people. I love them. And tell us how you estimate then when you have cufflinks, you have a grand maison. You also know the shop. What do you do? So cufflinks, I think, are one of those marmite things. Mm -hmm. Totally. Some women wear them, and yep. some men wear them. Yeah. So I do always find I have to be somewhat conservative with cufflinks because the amount of gentlemen out there who wear cufflinks is sadly slipping a little bit. Um, so I do try and be quite conservative with my estimates on cufflinks in order to get a lot of people interested. The whole point of an auction and why it's really important to work with an auction house that you trust the specialist at is that we only do well if you do well. So if we tell you, look, this is the smart way to present them. It's, it's in our best interest and yours because we are really trying to get you the best result. I lose money. If a lot doesn't sell, I've lost money. So we are really trying to help and get, you know, interest going and, and competitive bidding going. So these have been put in for 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. I mean, and considering that everyone on this call is super chic, get in. You can get such a great deal. You have heritage, you have design. Boy, do you have design. So fun. I love them. Remind us the lot number again, please. Thir 139. 139. I will see 18 you. karat gold. Interestingly shaped cufflinks. <laughs> All right. in, the, in the interest of time, let's do the big hunt. So let's put up the Fab Cartier piece and talk about how you could possibly 
trace down all this information. Oh, that's so nice. Christopher Walling just said you are the most enchanting guest I've had on. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> and Helen Molesworth just said the catalog photo is hilarious. It's a See? framer. It's a framer. All right. I'm going to start <laughs> comments. Put your questions in the question box. Here we go with the big one, the one that everyone's been waiting for. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, <laughs> oh, get in my belly. Dead. Love. Okay, so how does this piece show up? And do they know everything about it? Or did you have to go into finding things out? So this one was quite a good one, actually. Um, I've been working on this one for a long time, actually. You talked about how long these things talked, take. Yeah. Um, so I first met this client in uh, December. Okay. I went to see her at her home in South London. She was very gracious and had me there. It was kind of when things were on the brink of lockdown. And um, so it was, it was nice to be able to see people and provide that extra level of service so that they felt comfortable. Um, so yeah, it's taken me a good couple of months to, uh, you know, work with her and, and do some research with her and everything. So this, let's just start with what it is. This is Gautier, as you might have noticed from the box. It is Art Deco, so mid-1920s. It's diamonds and rock crystal in the center. Yeah. It's a lapel brooch. Um, I can imagine on a really beautiful drapey silk gown, just fastening it here, and it just sort of sparkles as you move and dance the night away. Or on a tuxedo on a man. I love this on everybody. I was just saying that to a client. You know, you get that sort of Tom Ford, the, the real jewelry heavy um, gentlemen who are wearing fabulous pieces nowadays. I think it would look awesome on a tuxedo. If that goes in, you would slay in this. Love. Exactly. Okay. So, yeah. So she knew it was Cartier. Okay. Um, obviously, the box is a bit of a getaway. <laughs> Um, and she knew some details about everything. In total, um, we have a private collection from her family of 12 lots. So it's the last 12 lots in the auction, if you want to see it. Can I, how much does the box matter? So if there is the original case you have, in this case, you have tons of documentation. Do you automatically have a percentage up that you're going to estimate in your pre-lot estimate for like the and all the materials? I always say that the box adds appeal. Okay. That's so if a client says to me, oh, I might go home and try and find the box. I say, yeah, please do. Please do. Because it adds appeal. Mm -hmm. Now, look, don't get me wrong. Cartier boxes, particularly art deco ones, particularly presentation boxes like this do have a cash value. So if you've got any hanging around, call me. There was one that sold recently. There was a tiara, um, a Cartier tiara one, and it was just the box. It sold at an auction house here in the UK, and it sold for thousands just for the box. Box? The box. Well, I mean, where are you going to store your tiara properly? There. Good to I know. Don't... Yeah, I mean, do you have a shoebox to hand? <laughs> so I, you're... Member, the client knows it's Cartier. Does she know anything about how it, I mean, how did it come to her? So this has been passed down. It was a relative of hers. This belonged to a woman named Augusta McCraig. Okay. Augusta McCraig was a New York socialite. Uh, she, she died in 1965. Um, so it's gone down a few generations to the current owner. Um, and Augusta McCraig, what was interesting was that she was part of pretty much the pinnacle of the New York social scene. Um, she, she, I, the client knew that there was a connection to Cornelia Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. which was lovely. So Cornelia Vanderbilt got married in 1924 at the Biltmore in uh, North Carolina. A friend of mine just stayed there, actually. It looks so nice. nice. Okay. So, so nice. And um, so, so that so she gave me a lot of little nuggets. Okay. And I spent, I'm not kidding, at least a whole day down a rabbit hole, and I ended up making her family tree. Of course, you did. 
like a Unabomber, Sarah, a little bit. <laughs> At a couple, oh my God, I want this. Same. I hear you. Yes. All right. So you're, you're making your Unabomber map. And what, I know you put up some wild photos in Egypt in the car. You turn up. And, and more importantly, what does that level of provenance mean to you? as the curator, as the, you know, as the authenticator, are you coming up with an added value from it? Or is it just love of the piece? What, where are you going with it? So for me, the value that I put on it, just um, so everyone, sorry. I would hold it up some more if you don't mind. Yeah. I mean, let's face facts. Who wants to look at me when you can look oh, at this? They're here for this. It's so <laughs> Okay. Um, the auction estimate for this is 12 to 15,000 pounds. Okay, so you know that's psychological. And I want to pause you there because you know you're giving a tease and there's no way. So um, I know I've talked about this before, but I think this is a really good time to go through what's the composition of the bidders and how changed over time because there's a real tendency for private bidders who've never been on a line at an auction to get emotional and to go a little nutsy and you would be lying if you said that you did not go very low to get those people in right because this is an encouraging number you're like oh my god I could get the most historic piece ever because 12 to 15 is in my range I'm in there and as Benoit Rappelin said once they're in there they tend to stay and get even more excited, right? The, so, the auction business is so psychological. Fascinating. So really. has COVID changed the mix that you're seeing between private dealers, first timers? What are you seeing on your end? Yeah, we've seen a real demographic switch to a much younger buyer. Um, and I think that's fantastic. That was that was one for me when I when I came here and I started the jewelry department, that was one of my most important things is I really wanted I wanted there to be a next generation of buyers because I wanted to have a job when I was 70 or 60 <laughs> because at the moment you know ten, five ten years ago you know it was very much so all about the one percenters you know we really needed those top top buyers to buy the most amazing things in the world because that was what made all the auction headlines that was what got you into the times and New York or London, whatever. And, and that's what got your house, your auction house, notoriety. And of course, as what was her name, the uh, advertising executive for De Beers in the 50s, the oh. big ones sell the little ones. The big ones sell the little ones. That's such, and it still holds, right? You it get still right holds. to go in, but you want a memory of it. You want a piece of it and you're there. So this fab piece is lot number what? This is one eight nine. Okay. Last lot in the sale. This is our our hero piece with a fascinating story, right? Which is going to bring people in. How much of a premium have you added because you have this insane provenance to the Vanderbilts to tracing this all the way out to a Grand Maison and then the intrinsic value because rock crystal breaks and this is in great condition. This is also just a super example of Cartier art work. So exactly. You went mad low. So was it just pure psychological? Well, to be really fair, as anyone in this business knows, when you're looking at auction estimates versus insurance valuations, that it can be sort of almost 10 times an insurance valuation could be 10 times an auction estimate. Yeah. And they had actually had an insurance valuation done when they inherited this 15, 20 years ago. And it, it wasn't a huge figure. It was done in America. It was in the 20s, uh, 20,000 range. So, you know, we all had expectations. I have to admit, the rabbit hole that I went down in adding provenance, adding history, um, was done after the time of consignment. But we knew it was in perfect condition. We knew it was from the best period of Cartier's output. We knew that it had not been on the market in a hundred years. So yes, it's, it's designed to get people excited. It's designed to reflect, you know, um, the sort of idea that you can obtain unbelievable jewels in an auction. But, you know, the provenance does usually come through later uh, when, you're, when you're doing the research as, as an auctioneer. Um, Sometimes you have the pleasure of doing it beforehand, but not always.
Katie Callahan just said, you knew it should be mine. <laughs> so good. Uh, so uh, you were asked in advance if you have ever evaluated a piece and found it to be fake and how you handle it with a client. Would you mind giving us an example? You know what? It's really funny. I've got one on my desk, actually. Let's do it. So again, because of lockdown, we're, we're meeting clients um, digitally a lot more. And a lot of times um, clients are sending things in. So a client sends me a picture of a bunch of things. And one of them was what looked like a diamond single stone ring. I said, okay, send it in. We'll have a chat and we'll figure it out. She sent in a bunch of things. The diamond ring I look at, I look at, this is not right. This is not right. This is it. It's on my desk. Uh -oh. It looks like a very classic, you know, 1.2 carat solitaire diamond ring. It's silver and CZ. Oh, sorry. And usually I really like to have a conversation with someone on the phone, sure. you know, or in person. But I had to email her because yeah. she, she wasn't picking up her phone. So I had to email her and say, look, I'm really very sorry, but this, this isn't a diamond. And she just sent me back the best email I've ever had in my life. And it said something along the lines of literally fallen off my chair laughing. Thank God I didn't marry him. <laughs> oh, that's so terrible. <laughs> it was brilliant. <laughs> And the reason it's still here on my desk is she said, do not send it back to me. I put it in the bin. Go take it to oh, a charity shop. <laughs> my God. That is so bad. Oof. Um, yikes. Uh, <laughs> and actually, that brings me to another very, very good element to keep in mind when you're looking at auction houses, which is that you do get a lot of engagement-ish rings, and you can get a terrific deal. Do you have anything in the sale that you can show us? that if someone's looking to get engaged and they want to find a terrific opportunity, something cool, will you? Oh, good. Oh, oh, not, not even subtle. All right, turning off the, the comments, put your questions in the question box. Okay, you know what? I might say- Will you say yes? I might say yes. Wham. What, what are we looking at and what's the lot? For? So this is lot 108. This what? is a five, sorry, uh, yeah, a 5.47 carat emerald cut. Okay. It's certificated. It's a hunk and it's fabulous. Yeah. The, what the one thing I like about it is the proportions of the diamonds. Pretty. Really pretty. It, What's the it has? So it's VS2. Ooh. 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 So for those of you watching, I clean. Remember, <laughs> great times magnification. Nifty. The compromise here, and buying jewelry, buying a diamond, you're always going to make a compromise. The compromise yep. here is the color. What is it? It's L. So what skin tone would work with an L and have it look like it is appropriately colorless? Because... <laughs> Depends on what your tone is, right? Some people will perfectly cool with an L. One of my best friends, she um, is she's from South London. She's as London as they come. Her family's from India. Yep. And we just bought her engagement ring together. Not her fiance, me and her. Hilaire. <laughs> um, and she wanted a tinted diamond. Okay. It was all she ever wanted. She knew exactly what she wanted. I wanted a tinted diamond because that's where I'm going to get my value. And her skin cone just makes tinted diamonds look amazing. She's like every photographer's dream. Wow. So if you have a warmth to your skin tone, it can balance out. Yeah, sorry, love. It can balance out the yellow that you're going to get. Most diamonds are going to display a slight color of some point, whether that's yellow gray or brown in this case it's a little bit of yellow which is the most common really and it's set in platinum white. uh it's stamped for 18 karat white gold so i'm surprised that they didn't set it in yellow gold to try to hide the yellow because i i would sneak that through with a yellow gold so what do to you be, think to be really honest every single person i show this to goes really oh and people who know what they're doing people who've never shopped before oh, people who've been looking for a while Okay. Let me try and turn it around. Um, sorry. And 
Sarah, for this one, can you give us the pre-sale estimate? Yep, this has an auction estimate of fifteen to twenty thousand. Okay, so that is missing a zero compared to what it would cost you to purchase that. A little bit closer in the colorless range. So you want to propose, you want to look like a baller. You don't happen to have a hundred and fifty thousand in your pocket, but you might have fifteen to twenty. That's a terrific way to go, I think. It's it's a great ring. It's, it's the sort of thing that every girl dreams of when she's okay. growing up in Beverly Hills. Oh, and every boy, too. I'm going to give it to everybody. Everybody deserves an emerald cut. Why not? 100%. Uh, and they're such lovely cuts, especially when they have nice proportions. This has got excellent for symmetry, excellent for polish and the certificate. It's nice to have a good, I like to say a fat emerald cut. Mm -hmm. You know, when they get little skinny ones, they look like a brick. It's not so nice. Uh -huh. Um, we've we've run out of time, so I'm going to go sort of quickly to a couple of questions that were sent in. So how, what would you say is the biggest misconception about your role as an auctioneer, as the head of department in an auction house in general? I would say the, the biggest misconception is that it's a very glamorous job. <laughs> and I think everyone in this industry will probably agree with it. You spend a lot of time... And don't get me wrong, I love it. I really love it. And I, I think that's the important thing is to work with someone who does love doing the digging. As, as, a, as an, um, an archaeologist, I don't mind digging. <laughs> that was full circle, too, because we started with an archaeologist. I really like that. Thanks. Oh. But for instance, when I say I pulled this one out of a pile of costume jewelry, I'm not kidding. This client had boxes and boxes, a long sort of refractory style table full of costume jewelry. And I fished out about eight or 10 pieces from there. But it took, you know, hours to go through and find the, the diamonds amongst the rough. So yeah, it isn't as glamorous as we want it to be. We try our best to add the glamour in. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably it. And um, for, are there any y lessons learned that you would share with young collectors for how to approach auctions and bidding? I know you in particular really want those young collectors. Yeah, I would say don't be, sh don't be shy. Do not be shy. Do not be scared to ask a million questions. Even if you can't come to the viewings in person, call up, talk to someone, ask to do a Zoom viewing. I think, and I've done this myself, I think buying something just for financial positioning is probably the worst thing you can do. And you know, you think, God, that's a good deal. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that. It's, if you don't love it, it doesn't love you back. Mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't. And then you start getting bitter about it and you feel like the thing owes you something. Mm -hmm. and, and it just becomes a really toxic relationship. And we do have relationships with our jewelry. I'm, I'm not going to be sounding really weird here. I think most people listening in would agree. But, you know, you, you, you have a, 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 a love-hate relationship with some of your pieces. You have a pure love relationship with others. I have a pair of antique coral earrings that I just adore. They're Victorian. They're strawberries. They're adorable. But they're the type that feed in from the back forward. If, you, if you've ever seen these old Victorian ones, it takes me 45 minutes to put those things on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super annoying, but it's worth it. Super annoying, not fun. And then you leave the house with ears the size of, you know, strawberries because they're all swollen up. <laughs> um, and then for a young gemologist starting out, how do you recommend thinking about whether the auction houses and auctioneering beyond the auction houses might be a fit? And how do you recommend entering the field these days? I think if you're a gemologist, auction houses are amazing places to learn. Even if you've done your FGA, your GG, things like that, there is no better platform out there than, uh, yeah, than an auction house. Because as someone who once worked in a museum, you, you know, you can look at something and there's a lovely tag that tells you exactly what it is. But in an auction house, someone walks in and goes, what's that? Love. They don't know. You have to figure it out. Love. 
That's so cool. So I think that's the perfect note to end on. Thank you, everybody, for watching. The auction itself is on the 28th. You can go to Chiswick Auctions. This was the tip of the iceberg. So make sure you go through and really mark your, your uh, lots because there's a lot of opportunity because Miss Sarah Duncan is amazing at digging and finding the history. So thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Sarah. You are the best. Pleasure. No, thank you so much for doing this. It's such a great opportunity. I'm just thrilled anyone's interested in our little auction house. It was a blast. See you soon, everybody. Have a great day, Sarah. Thank you. Bye. Ciao.